Good evening, boys and girls, and welcome to another edition of Tucked in Tuesday. This week, we're going to read a story called Pigsty by Mark Teague. And this is a book about a little boy named Wendell who has a really hard time keeping his room clean. I bet none of you have that problem, do you? All right, let's find out what happens to Wendell when he goes upstairs to clean his bedroom. Pigsty by Mark Teague. Monday afternoon, Wendell Foltz's mother told him to clean his room. It's turning into a pigsty, she said. Wendell went upstairs. Much to his surprise, a large pig was sitting on his bed. Pardon me, said Wendell. He shoved some toys into his closet, but the pig didn't seem to mind the mess, and Wendell found that he didn't mind the pig either. He decided to take a break. When Wendell's mother came to look at his room, the pig was hiding, but the mess was still there. She threw up her hands. Okay, Wendell, she said. If you want to live in a pigsty, that's up to you. Wendell could hardly believe his luck. Now I can live however I want. He didn't even worry when he came home on Tuesday and found a second pig in his room. The mess had grown a bit worse, but he was able to jam most of it under his bed. Pigs are all right, he said, as long as it's only one or two. In fact, they had a wonderful time. They played Monopoly until late each night and left the pieces lying all over the floor. They had paper airplane wars and pillow fights. The bed became a trampoline. Then two more pigs showed up. The mess just grew and grew. That night when Wendell went to bed, the pigs were lying everywhere. They rolled up in his blankets and hogged the pillows too. Wendell told himself he didn't mind, but when he found hoof prints on his comic books, that was a different story. And Friday when he got home from school, he saw that someone had been sitting on his basketball. And his baseball cards were chewed. That does it, said Wendell. I've had enough. He ran downstairs to tell his mother. Sorry, she said, but your room is your responsibility. She handed him a broom. Wendell started to complain. The mess was too huge. But suddenly he remembered a saying he'd heard that many hooves make light work. He marched upstairs and organized a cleaning crew. They swept and scoured, polished and scrubbed. Later that afternoon, Wendell inspected his room and pronounced it clean. In fact, it was a bit too clean from a pig's point of view. So while Wendell inspected, the pigs prepared to go home. One of them made a phone call and a farm truck came to pick them up. They hugged and grunted and oinked goodbye. From that day on, Wendell kept his room clean. Except for those nights when his friends came by to play Monopoly. End. Pigs in a bedroom? Can you even imagine that? I'd be freaked out if I went upstairs to one of my girls' rooms and saw pigs in their bedroom. Good thing they're pretty good at keeping their rooms clean. I hope you are too. All right, friends, now it's time to move on to our chapter book, The Chocolate Touch. And if you remember, our friend John Midas, he loves chocolate. He loves chocolate more than anything else in the world. And if you also remember, he was on his walk to his friend Susan Buttercup's house, and on the way, he found a coin, which he was able to use at a candy shop that he found. Um, and he bought this big box of what he is assuming is chocolate. So let's find out what happens when John gets home and gets into that box. All right. John decided that it might be sensible to enter his house quietly by way of the kitchen. With the large candy box hidden behind him, he let himself in by the back door and crept up the kitchen stairway on tiptoe toward his own room on the top floor. Just as he was about to round the corner on the second floor to continue his way upstairs, he had to stop for a moment while his father walked by, coming along the hall from the, the bedroom telephone. That was Mrs. Buttercup on the phone, Mr. Midas called to Mrs. Midas as he walked down the front stairs. She said she was sorry John hadn't been able to get over to play with Susan this afternoon, but it was a good thing in a way, she thought, because Susan already is so excited about her birthday party tomorrow. I wonder where John, John could have got to. As soon as the second floor was quiet, 
John knew there was no longer danger and that his candy box would not be seen. He hurried silently up to his bedroom, pushed open the door, and slid the box under the bed. Then he walked heavily down the living room, down to the living room. Well, there you are, said Mrs. Midas. We couldn't imagine where you've been. What have you been doing? Oh, just playing around, John said. John usually took a long time to put his things away and undress and bathe and get ready for bed, for he thought sleeping was a waste of time. But that evening he started yawning long before his usual bedtime. Mm, I'm sleepy, John announced. All right, said Mrs. Midas, you'd better be getting ready for bed. Time to take your tonic. John's tonic came in a bottle. It had been prescribed by Dr. Cranium. John had to drink a big spoonful every night to make up for all of the vegetables and fruit that he had left on his plate at lunch and dinner. The tonic tasted like soap, mud, glue, ink, and paint. It tasted horrible. Much to Mrs. Midas's surprise, John ran ahead of her to the dining room, dining room cupboard where the tonic and tonic spoon were kept. By the time she got there, he had already filled the spoon. Then, without any coaxing, he emptied it into his mouth. Ugh, John spluttered. Blech. That's a very good boy, Mrs. Midas said. Now why can't you be sensible and eat up your nice dinner that way? If only you'd stop eating so much candy, you'd be able to eat your meals properly, and you wouldn't need to take the tonic. Soon John was scrubbed and in his pajamas and in bed, ready to be tucked in for the night. Mrs. Midas sat on the bed and stroked his forehead for a moment. Then she leaned forward and kissed his cheek. John, pretending that he was very sleepy, shut his eyes and began breathing deeply. When Mrs. Midas rejoined Mr. Midas in the living room, she said, I've never known John to be so good about going to bed before. He went to sleep in no time. A few seconds after the bedroom door closed behind his mother, John leaped to the floor. He got down on his hands and knees and felt under the bed for the candy box. He soon had it on the pillow and set to work on fastening it. First, he took off the thin outer sheet of cellophane. Then he lifted off the lid. Then he removed a sheet of cardboard. Then he pulled off a square of heavy tin foil. Then he took out a layer of shredded paper. As the wrappings piled up around him, John became rather anxious. At last, he came to a small central ball of cotton batting, and there, right in the middle, was a little golden ball. He picked at the ball with his fingernail and peeled away the gold paper, revealing a tiny piece of plain chocolate. It was the only piece of chocolate in the whole box. Deeply disappointed, John nevertheless put it into his mouth. He had never tasted chocolate quite like it. It was the most chocolatey chocolate he had ever encountered. Chapter 3 The birds were chirping in the trees outside John's window, and the sky beyond the, was beyond deep blue. The bedroom door opened a few inches. Hey, sleepy, Mrs. Midas called. Everyone else is up. John put on his bathrobe and slippers and ambled into the bathroom. His sister Mary was still brushing her teeth, and he had to wait for her to finish. Come on, Mary, he said a little crossly. Don't take all morning. Here you are, Mary said, handing him the toothpaste tube. While Mary soaped her face, John squeezed a little of the toothpaste onto his brush. The paste was pink. John made a face at the toothbrush. It didn't seem fair that he should have to brush his teeth with all the stuff that tasted just like tonic. A stinky taste, he called it. John opened his mouth and pushed, the end of the in, pushed in the end of the toothbrush. As soon as it touched the front of his teeth, he noticed a delicious sweetness in his mouth. A taste of the best kind of chocolate. He pushed the brush to and fro, and the taste seemed to grow stronger. He removed the brush. The bristles were brown. What kind of toothpaste is this, John asked. Mary was drying her face. The same kind, she answered. It says on the tube. Blanco Dent, John read. It was the same kind they always had. Why is it chocolate flavored this time, he asked. Boy, it's good. Silly, Mary said. Of course it isn't chocolate. She hung up her towel and swished out of the bathroom. John squeezed some more toothpaste onto his brush and continued to brush his teeth. Chocolate again. It was marvelous, rich, sweet, smooth, chocolate, chocolatey chocolate, just like the single piece of chocolate from the box the night before. There seemed to be no further need for the toothbrush, so John, John rinsed it and hung it up. He squeezed out another bit of toothpaste onto a fingertip this time. He put his finger in his mouth and ate the toothpaste off. When he took out his finger again, it was stained chocolate brown. John wasted no more time. He put the end of the toothpaste tube into his mouth and emptied the paste onto his tongue. It squeezed out like thick, creamy chocolate. Mary looked into the bathroom. Hey, what are you doing, she demanded. Yummy, was all John said. John and Mary were a little late getting to the dining, the dining room, and Mr. Midas was already on his way to the train when they sat down at the breakfast table. John ate up all the toothpaste, Mary told their mother. Oh, you sneak, John whispered. Well, you did, Mary reminded him. And that's a waste. Isn't it a waste, Mother, to eat up all of the toothpaste in one day? 
Mrs. Midas was serving their orange juice. Mary, really, she said. I'm sure John was only joking. He must have been pretending to eat the toothpaste. No, he wasn't, Mary insisted. I was watching. And I saw him squeeze it right into his mouth. He said it was chocolate. Oh, dear, protested Mrs. Midas. Chocolate again? Now I know it was just a joke. He just wished it were chocolate, Mary. Come on now, drink up your orange juice, both of you. Your bacon and eggs will be ready in a minute. As Mrs. Midas left the room, John took up his glass of orange juice and put it to his lips. As soon as he tilted it and the liquid began to flow into his mouth, a happy look came across his eyes. Boy, that's good, he said. And at last, lowering the empty glass, said, chocolate juice. Mary looked at John, then she looked at her glass of orange juice. It was bright orange color. She tasted it. She, it tasted like orange ju juice to her. It's not chocolate juice, she said. It's orange juice. Orange juice is good for you. Yes, John, Mrs. Midas said, hearing the last few words as she carried the tray of bacon and eggs. You must drink your... She caught sight of John's empty glass. John, she said, you good boy. That's the first time in ages you finished your orange juice without having to be told to do so. It tasted of chocolate, John, John explained. All right, Mrs. Midas said, very funny, but don't tease Mary too much. Remember, Mary's younger than you are. John silently picked up his fork and sliced the yellow yolk of his egg. The yolk broke over the white and he shivered as he watched as he always did. Ugh, I can't eat this, he told his mother. Of course you can, Mrs. Midas said. You drink your orange juice, try to eat your bacon and egg. John scraped up a small piece of egg and put it into his mouth. It immediately became chocolate. Chocolate white and chocolate yolk, both lovely, lovely chocolate. Mmm, John mumbled, chocolate egg. In almost no time, he had finished every scrap of egg on his plate. Then he tried the bacon. The bacon turned to chocolate too. John had never before enjoyed his breakfast so much. After the orange juice that had turned to chocolate juice in his mouth and the fried bacon and egg that had turned to fried chocolate, he ate two slices of chocolate toast with chocolate butter and chocolate marmalade washed down with a glass of chocolate milk. I am very pleased with you this morning, Mrs. Midas said as she helped John on with his coat. If you promise to eat your lunch at school as well as you ate your breakfast, I'll give you a dime to buy some chocolates with. Oh, that's all right, John said. I don't think I'll need it. Mrs. Midas looked puzzled as she waved goodbye. We're going to stop there. Next time we read, we'll find out what happens to John Midas when he goes to school, and we'll see if what he's eating still stays chocolatey. All right, boys and girls, I hope your jammies are on. I hope you have brushed your teeth with real toothpaste, not chocolate toothpaste, and that you are tucked in tight, and that you're all ready for a good night's sleep. We'll see you all here at school tomorrow. Have a great night.